All right, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. We all good? Praise the Lord. Preseason. Oh, preseason football? Oh, yeah, it's exciting. Get to watch a bunch of people not going to make the team. But it's good for them. What? I, it's kind of the truth. All right, that, that sounded mean. I'm sorry. Everybody gets a participation ribbon. Yay. Hey, next week, 10 a.m., one service. So if you usually come to this service, you'll be early, which I also encourage you to be early because I think we'll be packed. We're going to open up the balcony. We have some risers coming in so we can sit up there. There'll be more seats here. Be here at 10 so as a church body we can celebrate, come together. We're having baptisms next week, which tell, leads me to say if you haven't been baptized, if you haven't made just a public testimony in front of your church family that I'm a follower of Jesus, let's do it. All right, let's do it. So let us know. Uh, there's a welcome. What is this card? There's a card on your seat on the back has information. You can just scan that and sign up, and we will get connected with you. I'm going to mention this at the end as well, but every quarter or so we have a dinner that we call This Is Us. It is good towards those who are newer. So we had a full house planned, but five of the full house said they couldn't come tonight. So if you are newer... And want to meet some people, like just connect, find out about us. Newer, so you can define what newer is. We have spots for five, a dinner. I'll be there. If that's a bonus, come. If it's not a bonus, I won't be there. I'll just surprise you. So right after service, I'll be sitting here. If you want to come tonight and have dinner with us at five, we'd love to have you. We're in a home. Just come let me know you're coming. Does that make sense? I'll remind you afterwards as well. There's a couple of phrases that sound somewhat similar, but I think the path they may lead you on are very different. There's a phrase, why don't you, or have you ever even thought of, versus the phrase, what can I do for you? Or what can we do together? First phrase kind of sounds like you're being wise. I'm just giving input and an insight but you're refraining from participation. And the other one says, what can I do for you? It's like seeing somebody carrying uh, multiple bags of groceries in from the car. And the first phrase is kind of like, hey, if you just shifted the bags around a little bit, you could probably carry a little more. Versus as you're reaching for the bag to help, let me help you with those bags. My friend Jim Gaffigan, who is a comedian, I say he's my friend, he's not really my friend, but I call most comedians my friends because I just feel like they're my friends. And talking about having what it was like to have his fourth child says, you want to know what it's like to have four kids? Imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. <laughs> Life can be overwhelming and we have the opportunity or the ability to make it even harder. Part of taking the great commandment really seriously, the great commandment being loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself, is that word love. You might hear it often if you go to a, a wedding that love isn't just a feeling or emotion, right? But it's an active word. It's a participant word. And loving your neighbors is not the same as not hating your neighbors. There's actually a step. It's not just a lack of hate or indifference. And we listen to these words from Jesus that he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you just stop right there, and if that's what God has for you this morning, soak that in. But I got more. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only you, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So therefore, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Like how he just drops that in the end. Hey, love each other. And by the way, be perfect. 
So we'll get to that phrase, okay? I'm not going to leave that one there. We'll get to that at the end about being perfect. But here's my point. Avoiding those things, those people, the ideas, the ideologies that you disagree with, actually hate, just avoiding them or being indifferent to them is not love. In fact, if you stayed in your house all day long, just simply like, I just don't want to, like, you know, get in conflict, that doesn't mean you're loving your neighbor. Indifference or avoidance is not love. In fact, it actually might be unloving because you're withholding. You see, loving our neighbors or the people actually living in your house or the people that you work with, or the people that you go to school with, or the people that you go to church with, involves actively seeking out their well-being. Finding out what's behind the, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. What are we willing to do? You see, so often it's even just a difference in a mindset. It's the difference of, I signed up to go to a mission meal because I heard there's good food and I want to see what's there for me, versus I want to sign up to go to this meal to see what I can do for somebody else. James, the brother of Jesus, says it like this. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. It's dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. But I say, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Because you believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. We'll get to that point as well. So the two points I have ahead of me later is be perfect as God is perfect, and even the demons believe in God, and they shudder. I love this definition I came across, though. It's about compassion. Compassion is coming close to those who suffer. Coming close to those who suffer. And the reality is we can only come close to those that suffer when we choose to be vulnerable ourselves. Professor and author Brene Brown writes this about vulnerability. Vulnerability is an important measure of courage that allows you to be seen and understood by the people who are important in your life. Do you hear that? Vulnerability is a place of courage that allows you to be seen by whom? The people who are important in your life. She goes on, being vulnerable serves as a way of fostering authenticity, belongingness, and love. I think we all might say that, man, vulnerability is an attractive thing we see in other people, but let's all admit that it's hard, isn't it? I mean, you can define why it's hard in your own life. You can answer that yourself because vulnerability is associated with a number of emotions. Some of them shame, some of them fear, some of them feeling like you don't belong. Maybe it's fears of rejection or abandonment, because being vulnerable, vulnerable means you're taking chances, that you might get pushed away. Being vulnerable means that you're talking about mistakes that you have made, not just the other person has made. You're sharing personal details about your life that you normally keep quiet. You're feeling difficult emotions. You're reconnecting with those maybe you've fallen out from. And you need to be honest, maybe, about what you need in a relation or all things about being vulnerable. So to that, you're like, Dale, of course I don't want to be vulnerable. Those things sound awful. But if it is true that in order to show compassion to another, which means come close to another person, which would be to fulfill the actual commandment of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself, if vulnerability is important or essential in that whole piece, what are we willing to do? Because the reality is it takes a very special community of people or relationships that you're in 
where people are drawn together and vulnerabilities is anticipated. It's tough to be vulnerable. In my own life, I have found it much easier to suppress the things of my life to keep them at bay because then the impression I can give off was one that I always know what's going on. The sad part is, all of that stuff comes out at home, and Lisa gets all of that. She's like, why don't you just dump that on everybody else and save the good stuff for me? So that's what I learned to do. Every Sunday, I just dump stuff on you, and I'm much better at home. No, I'm just joking. I mean, I am, but there you go. But there's a piece of vulnerability that says, if Christ is in me, and the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in me, there's a power to be honest, knowing that God accepts. As Henry Nouwen wrote, a compassionate person says, I am your brother, I am your sister, I am human, fragile, and mortal, just like you. I am not scandalized by your tears, nor afraid of your pain. I too have felt pain. We can be with the other only when the other ceases to be other and becomes like us. Do you see his weaving there? We stay at an other, which is that phrase, why don't you just do this, or why don't you make your life better? But suddenly they become like us through the portal of vulnerability. But if we're called to come close to the one who suffers, being willing to be open is a must. This might be a huge change in your own life, in the way you process things. And I understand, I understand the difficult journey of opening things up. I understand firsthand that we might need to re-navigate some of our processing. And it starts in places of trust. I know this is a challenge because Jesus himself faced this challenge when he engaged with people. It seemed like they were stuck in their current way of thinking. They were stuck in their current way of processing. They were stuck about how things used to be or were. They were stuck about how things should be or how others should be. And they longed to not make a mistake while they were making mistakes. Jesus understood this. I've told you this story before, and I didn't give my daughter a heads up. I'm about to tell a story about you when you were two, so you don't remember. <laughs> when Anna was about two years old, we decided to take her to Sesame Street Live. I'm like, we're going to go take you to see Elmo. And she was so excited. I'm going to go see Cece. So that was what she called Sesame Street Live, not whatever else. It was at the Shark Tank SAP Center San Jose, so Lisa and I, since we are very frugal, went to the free parking, which is like blocks and blocks away. On the way from the parking lot to Sesame Street Live, which was Mecca for her at the time, there was a variety of things, like somebody making balloon art, making dogs, and Anna was like, I want a balloon. I'm like, Anna, we're running late. We need to get to Sesame Street Live. She goes, no, but I want this balloon animal, and I'm like, okay, so we sat there and Got a balloon animal while Sesame Street Live was about to start. We walked a little further. There was a policeman on a horse. In Anna's two-year-old mind, she's like, Dad, there's a horse. Thank you so much for bringing me to a place where there's a horse. I'm like, I could have saved a lot of money. We could have parked for free, got a balloon animal, and saw the horse. So now I'm trying to convince her to actually go to the arena. And she is crying and screaming because I am the worst father in the world who's making her leave the horse. We continue down. There's somebody else selling like food. Nothing to do with where we're actually going to end up. And she is so mad at me. And we finally get there. And she's just like, this is the greatest thing ever. Now let's pretend she's 25 and has tickets to Taylor Swift. <laughs> which she always seems to have. Valley Christian must be paying you way too much money. Steve, you're paying way too much money, brother. If she was to be like, I got tickets, if I got tickets to Taylor Swift, but I parked and I got distracted on the way, Dad, I, there was a balloon animal person, and I saw the horse. You know what? I didn't make it to Taylor Swift. 
I'd be like, what is wrong with you? You see, that's the very same kind of thing. Is like Jesus is like, I have the kingdom of God prepared for you. And you keep stopping along the way at the balloon animal or the horse. And there's so much more. But it's going to take a change of path, a change of focus. As you well know, Jesus opens his ministry saying this, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I want to look at that word repent for a few moments. That word repent in Greek is metanoia. If you've been around the Bible or church for a while, you probably have heard, and this isn't incorrect, that repent means to make a U-turn, to turn away and walk the other direction, right? You probably have heard that before, which isn't untrue. But if you break down this word, this Greek word metanoia, and the very etymology of the word, meta means beyond, and new means mind. So what Jesus is saying is, go beyond your present mind. Go beyond your present way of thinking and see something different. Don't simply turn away and still have the human view of what next. What Jesus is saying is repent can also mean back up from the situation. Maybe there's something different for you now. See it for what it is. What if in our relationships, what if in our uh, frustrations, what if in the things we're facing, we said, man, I'm going to repent and I'm going to back up and see this for what it is. Is this fight, is this disagreement really worth it? Is this situation that I am battling worth it? Jesus says, You need to change not just what you think, but how you're thinking about it. Are you with me? How are you thinking about it? Is there anything there for me? Compared to what Jesus has offered me on this path, is this thing in front of me the thing I want to die on? Is this political ideology the thing that I want to replace for the kingdom of God? Is this broken relationship the thing I want to replace? Is this frustration? Is this hurt? Do I really want that to be the thing I am choosing over what he has provided for me right now? I've been in pastoral ministry a long time. Been doing this uh, 35 years, I think, now. I'm a young youth pastor who just wanted to hang out with kids to not as young guy standing here now. Sometimes it's really hard for me to imagine that I'm 57 years old until I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh my gosh, looks like my dad. (laughs) But one of the things that I have seen, and this is just honest truth, one of the most difficult conversations that I have to have with people, not because I have to confront them, but because of pain in their own heart, is the suffering they have experienced because of the cold convictions of somebody else. You see, cold convictions about life or from the Bible without compassion brings incredibly deep hurt. I've experienced this in my own life. When I myself got a phone call from a doctor that I did not want to get telling me things about my physical body, I heard cold convictions of people like, It's because sin in your life that you're sick. And I'm like, if that was true, you would also be sick. (laughs) One person told me, oh, my uncle got this same thing and my aunt left him. Okay, not helpful at all. (laughs) There's people who say you lack faith. That's why. Now, all of those things might not all of those, Lisa's not leaving me, but the other two might, might have some truth. Is there sin in my life? Absolutely. Do I bring those that before God? Absolutely. Are there times I lack faith? Absolutely. 
But I will tell you the cold convictions of saying this is just how it is without any compassion breeds chaos in my life. And I'm guessing as I sit across from some of you who have heard some cold convictions of somebody else who's saying, well, this is what the Bible says. There's something wrong with you. It causes chaos in their life. Journeying with people through those kinds of cold chaos is really hard because what Jesus came to do was what? Break the chaos, to bring shalom. And chaos enters. I remember, though, telling some close friends when I first got sick about this thing. This is what conviction and compassion looks like. There was this friend of mine. Um, she is the strongest human being I know. This isn't just strong, like, morally strong. I mean, like, physically strong. Like, she could pick me up over her head and, like, spin me and throw me. Like, kind of, like, she's just the strongest human being I know. And with great conviction, she looked into my eyes, and she says, God has you, Daryl, which is true. And with great compassion, she said, and this is what it feels like. Then she came in for a hug. Now, having MS, there's pain involved in my body, but she didn't care. So she just came in and squeezed me so hard. She goes, this is what God's compassion feels like. I mean, that squeeze was so hard, I'm still feeling it 14 years later. As I'm like, oh, dear Lord, okay, okay, Jen, stop. But she goes, I just don't want you to forget or ever stop feeling it. You see, that's what compassion with conviction is like. That is what conviction of truth and presence feels like. We know this. There's this letter in the New Testament that was written by Peter. It was one of Jesus' closest followers, right? And the Christian world is about 60 AD, had been scattered under great persecution. Nero probably was in charge at the time, just tormenting, as we understand history, Christianity. And it was breaking, which God used the tormenting of Christians to actually spread the gospel. But this is what Peter writes to them. Listen to this. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted, because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. That's a loaded phrase. If you are slandered, pushed aside, mocked, whatever it is, be blessed. Because what? The spirit of glory and God rests on you. Such a strange phrase, right, for the modern ear, like the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. But if you've taken our biblical literacy course, you know that one of the things we ask in understanding Scripture is what would the original audience have understood. The original audience hearing this understood something. They understood the Old Testament story of God coming and residing upon his people. After the children of Israel had been freed from the clutches of Egypt, God starts to show himself and his presence comes down and it's known as the Shekinah glory. The Shekan, which is Hebrew for resides, and Yah, which is the glory. If you look at these different moments of, the, of the, even the Exodus, some in the morning, you shall see the glory of God. This is God's provision for them. The glory of the Lord settled upon Mount Sinai. It's a literal cloud came on as Moses was meeting with God. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled their tabernacle. When they built the tabernacle, they could literally see God come down in this cloud. And all who were in the, in the area, in the camp, would go like, God is present with us. When Solomon built the temple and dedicated it, it says the glory of the Lord filled the house. There was a literal cloud moving around. They knew there was a tangible thing of God's glory coming down, so when Peter wrote this, the people knew that when they struggled, when they suffered, 
it was like the cloud coming down and resting on your shoulders. Hear me, my friends. When there's suffering, the spiritual world is activated. God and the devil want you. If the spiritual world is activated when someone is suffering, how much more should the physical world be activated as well so that people will not miss what God's present looks like in a person, in a presence? You see, God comes to rest upon his temple. And in the New Testament, who is now his temple? We are says here in 1 Corinthians, you yourselves are God's temple when God's spirit dwells in you. So listen to this. Be blessed because when you suffer, when you have hard times, when you are slandered, God's presence comes and resides on you. What does residing on you look like? It looks like that hug where my friend squeezes the heck out of me. It looks like that person who draws near to you in compassion and vulnerability to be close to you, to listen to you. If there's no other call on you this morning, for those who are suffering, God's spirit resides on you. And be present. Allow others to be near you. If you know someone suffering, be that presence of Jesus or drawing near to them, knowing that you're not alone in this. But as I close, let me grab the two things I said I would grab. The first one is this, the demons shudder. Some of you just woke up because you're like, sweet, Dale's going to talk about demons. <laughs> not as much as you think. James is making this point. There is a kind of belief which is purely intellectual. It is conviction without compassion. It has literally no outward effect. This is the why don't you do this? What is wrong with you? You just, it's advice giving kind of thing. This is the kind of posture that brings chaos into situations and not shalom. And James says this, even the demons have that kind of belief, and it does nothing for them. In fact, it says the demons shudder. When Jesus walked into the room, the demons knew who he was, and they shuddered because they had no square footing anymore. They knew they were at risk. I mean, this must have been hard to hear, right? Like, if you're one of those people, like, no, I have conviction. I know what to believe. I know all the books. I, I, and I know all these things. He's like, yeah, so do the demons. He stops short of saying, you too are a demon. He doesn't say it, but do you see the connection that our faith is worth not much as well? But there's a second piece. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I know what you might be thinking. Okay, I don't want to be a demon, but how in the world can I be perfect? Is that what Jesus is really saying? And I think this is what the aspirational goal, this is what the kingdom is. This is the pathway to not get stuck at balloons and horses, but to get to the place that God intended. Whenever in, in the Greek thought or in the Greek words, whenever the word perfect is used, it's the word teleos. The word teleos means to be complete and mature. For a reference point, a full-grown human being, in a reference of being full-grown, would be a teleos human as opposed to a child that's still developing. That would not be teleos. Teleos is full-grown and developed. If somebody had pursued a field of study and they've acquired enough, all the knowledge they needed to perform something in education, they would be teleos versus an original learner or initial learner. To put it another way, the Greek idea of perfection is 
fully functional. To have conviction without compassion is not fully functional. To have compassion with no conviction is not fully functional. To be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Jesus for sure is saying you need to keep doing the things that are right, but for your own development to be what God designed you to be. So what has God designed us to be? Fully functional is like this. Fully functional is like this. Let's say there's a little nut loose on your car. Like you open your engine and somehow you found something loose. I open my engine and just go, wow. And then I call my friend. But you see, and I have one of these things you open up like a socket wrench, you know those things? And it has like 20 different sizes of, of sockets. And you put it on, and like, if it's not the right size, you're not doing anything. Like, I could pretend my neighbor could be, what are you doing, Dale? Oh, I'm fixing my truck, and it's the wrong size wrench, and it's just spinning. And he's like, oh, I'm impressed. Let me see. Oh, no, don't, don't see, you know. But if you had the right size, and it fit on the nut, and then you popped it on, and you could actually move it and tighten it, that socket wrench is teleo meaning it's the right tool for the job. Hear me. At the very beginning, God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. What is the image of God and likeness of God? So many things. But it is love. It is deeply compassionate. It is deeply conviction. So it's like love. You are fully functional. You are teleos. You are saying the phrase, how can I help you? When you are loving that person that is so hard to love. As Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It could be in your home. It could be in a relationship. It could be at school. It could be your job. Or God right now is asking you, I just want you to be teleos. I want you to function as I have created you to function and draw near to that person in vulnerability and compassion. And be who I've designed you to be. Let's pray. Just clarifying that as we cry out to you only. In this world, we cry out to a lot of things. We look to a lot of things. And I think that's what you said. Well, yeah, this, the demons show there as well. That this, there's, there's no value in that. So we cry out to me. And with great compassion great conviction of love I will come and rest upon you we thank you for that Father we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy Amen Amen we'd love to uh, find you with a couple things baptisms if you're interested we'd love to be able to do that and celebrate with you next week you're newer or somewhat newer or you're hungry, we, uh, we have a dinner tonight at 5 that we have some space to. I'll be right up afterwards. Like, hey, I want to come. I'll uh, sign you up and uh, give you the address of where we're going to be. And we just would love to have you if you want to meet some people. Maybe you've been coming for a while and you really just haven't met anybody. You want to talk? Come. Just sign up and we'll have a good time. Right? Let me pray for you as we leave. Father, I just pray for my friends and my family that they would know the height and depth and width of your love for them, that nothing can separate them from your love for them. May they go out from here with the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that they can have great compassion and conviction for their neighbor, that we as a community can be a place where vulnerability is not just okay, but encouraged. We ask for your help. We love you. In your name, amen. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Have an amazing, amazing week.